Welcome everyone. My name is Kelly Hancock. I'm the Director of Programs at the American Civil War Museum in Richmond, Virginia. But we also uh, have a, a site in Appomattox, Virginia. And uh, we run uh, in Richmond, uh, in addition to the museum, the White House of the Confederacy. A lot of, uh, a lot of different places uh, for you to visit if you're ever in the area. Now, as always, I like to start out with just a few announcements about programs that we have coming up. And we do have a book talk on March 2nd, and this will be with Pat Brennan, Gettysburg in Color. This is volume one from uh, Brandy Station to the Peach Orchard. So you can plan on joining us for this virtual program that starts at 6.30 on uh, Thursday, March 2nd. And then uh, if you're in the Appomattox area, or even if you're in Richmond and you don't mind that uh, short drive, we have an in-person program on March the 9th. We'll have James Hessler with us, who is a certi certified Gettysburg battlefield guide and author. And he will be speaking on Pickett's Charge. What was Lee thinking? So um, join us for this in-person program in Appomattox. Now for tonight, uh, as a, a way of helping to celebrate and commemorate Black History Month. Uh, we have uh, with us Jenny Page, who is the research manager at the National Medal of Honor Museum. And uh, I am going to turn the screen over uh, to Jenny Page and let her tell you a little bit about the museum and also uh, the work that she does. Perfect. Thank you, Kelly. Um, so as Kelly mentioned, my name is Jenny Page. I work at the National Medal of Honor Museum. Um, we are located in Arlington, Texas. Uh, so right in between Dallas and Fort Worth, if you're familiar with the DFW area. Um, a little bit about my background. I started out um, working seasonally for the National Park Service, and that's how I actually got involved with the Medal of Honor. My first introduction to that was uh, with Sergeant William Carney when I was working for National Parks of Boston. Um, so this is kind of coming full circle. Uh, a little bit about our museum. We broke ground in March of 2022. So we're just coming up on about a year of construction, slated to open in late 2024. Um, the museum is, I like to tell people, a biography museum. It's not meant to be a military or a war museum, although we tell those stories. Um, it's really meant to tell the stories of the people that were Medal of Honor recipients. Uh, 3,515 individuals have received the Medal of Honor out of almost 40 million Americans that have served in the military. It's a very small percentage. Uh, the Medal of Honor is awarded to those who go above and beyond the call of duty um, while in service to the, to the United States. Um, the men and one woman who have received this recognition. Um, they are all incredible stories. Uh, we struggle around here to choose those that will be highlighted in the museum. Obviously, we only have so much room, so fitting as many in as we possibly can. Um, and I think as we, as we go through today, you'll see that each story is absolutely incredible. Um, today, we're gonna focus on the story of Sergeant William Carney. Um, Again, as I said, he's a, he's a Massachusetts native. I worked for National Parks of Boston um, and I am from Massachusetts myself. So very near and dear to my heart. Um, so we'll get into that story. So a little bit about Sergeant Carney. Um, he's born in February of 1840 in Norfolk, Virginia. Born enslaved, not much is known about his early life um, as I'm sure Many of you who study the Civil War know those who are enslaved um, and gain freedom uh, through self-liberation often don't write about their stories, uh, especially during the Civil War out of you know fear of not sure what that outcome is going to be. Um, so we actually don't know too much about the, the beginning of William Carney's life. 
What we do know is that at some point while he is enslaved, um, he defies anti-literacy laws and learns how to read and write. Specifically, um, he starts studying the Bible pretty closely. Um, we also know quite a bit about his father's early life, William Carney Sr. Um, William Carney Sr.'s early life is written down um, in, a, in an account by a man named William Still, who writes about Underground Railroad stories. Uh, we know that William Carney Sr. gained his freedom through the Underground Railroad and later um, told his story to William Still, and it's published. We also know a little bit about uh, Carney Sr.'s life through his son. Um, his son does write pretty pretty extensively uh, for what he has written about how his father gained his freedom. Um, again, keeping his own story a little bit quieter. Um, so as we go through tonight, I'll tell you a little bit about how William Carney Sr. gained his freedom and then the possibilities that there are for how William Carney um, may have gained his, his freedom. So William Carney Sr. is enslaved also in Norfolk, Virginia by a woman named uh, Sarah Twine, most likely on Buck Row Plantation, which the, the photo you see on the screen is of the slave quarters at Buck Row Plantation in 1968. Um, Sarah Twine owned a roughly 112 slaves. She's noted to be a woman with a reputation of wealth uh, in 1850. All of her property is valued at about 25,000, which equals out to just shy of a million dollars today. Um, very wealthy woman. Um, she's also, as William Still writes, uh, she meddled too freely with the cup and under its influence was very desperate and acted as though she wanted to kill some of her slaves. Um, so she clearly has a little bit of a drinking problem um, and that that does translate to the way that she runs her household. Now, Sarah Twine agrees and openly tells her slaves quite often that at the time of her death, they will all be freed and transported to Liberia where they will enjoy freedom. Um, and there's just another great quote that I absolutely love from, from the William Still account in which he says, quote, with full faith in her promises, year by year, the slaves awaited her demise with as much patience as possible and often prayed that her time might be shortened for the general good of the oppressed. So William Carney Sr., he has a, we know from the still account, a full family, a wife um, possibly named, it's either Nancy or Ann Dean, accounts vary, as well as eight children. So William Carney Jr. has seven brothers and sisters. It's unclear whether his entire family lives on the Twine property, um, but what we do know is that anyone who would have been living on the Twine property was promised freedom at the time of her death. Twine dies in 1856, um, and this is going to be significant in just a moment. When Twine dies, it is soon realized by those who are enslaved on the property that they are not going to be freed. And still has this account in which he talks about Carney Sr. is slowly coming to the realization that his family is going to be split apart. He could be sold further south, and he realizes that he needs to escape. Um, so, so Carney Sr. and another uh, one of the enslaved members of that estate, a man named Andrew Allen, decide that they're going to try and escape. Um, they hire a man and they go th you know, through the Underground Railroad uh, to gain their freedom. He first goes to Pennsylvania um, and, and Carney Jr. actually talks about how his father finds that the land where the Declaration of Independence is written is not as free as he once thought. And so then he travels to New York. And again, he finds that it's not meeting his needs. So finally, Carney Sr. settles on New Bedford, Massachusetts. Now, as I said, that, that year 1856 is pretty significant. That's the year that Sarah Twine dies. That's the year that we know Carney Sr. Um, started through the Underground Railroad. And as I said before, we don't know much about Carney Jr.'s early life. 
However, we do have one line that he writes about gaining his gaining his freedom, or excuse me, his father's freedom. And he wrote that in 1856, I left for the sea for some time, and my father left to find a place to live in peace and freedom. And so I don't, you know, there's speculation that William Carney uh, Jr. may have found his freedom through the Maritime Underground Railroad. This is the only line right now that we have that indicates that. Um, obviously, in 1863, Carney Jr. is not uh, aware of what the outcome of the war will be. So he is not going to write exactly how he gained his freedom. He's protecting himself. Um, so this is still vague. Uh, there are other accounts that think his father may have purchased his freedom and uh, brought him to Massachusetts. And there are other accounts um, that say Carney made his way through the Underground Railroad like his father. Nevertheless, by 1863, we know that all um, the Carney, so Carn, uh, Carney Jr., Carney Sr., his mother, and several of his siblings are in New Bedford, Massachusetts. It's unclear whether all eight children made it. Um, it's very likely that not all eight did, but we do know several of them did make it to Massachusetts. Um, as I mentioned, Carney's mother, there is a little bit of discrepancy uh, with her name, whether it's Anne Dean or Nancy, most likely Nancy. Uh, in 1863, William Carney Jr. does write that her name's Anne Dean, but we do think that may have been for, you know, to protect her as well as, again, we don't know the outcome of the war in 1863. Um, Anne Dean or Nancy, however we call her, um, she very likely um, was freed upon the death of her enslaver. And again, in 1863, they're all in New Bedford, Massachusetts. While in New Bedford, um, Carney begins to build a life for himself. Um, he takes jobs in various stores. He gets really involved in the community. Um, and this is going to be a theme that you'll see throughout most of William Carney's life. He gets very involved in his community. Um, as I said before, during his youth, he learns uh, to read and write. He studies the Bible pretty closely, um, gets involved in his local church. And prior uh, to entering the military, he strongly considers entering the ministry. Um, he thinks he's going to go on um, and become a minister. However, as one of his one of his famous quotes, he says, uh, quote, previous to the formation of colored troops, I had a strong inclination to prepare myself for the ministry, but when the country called for all persons, I could best serve my God by serving my country and oppressed brothers. And this is my favorite part. The sequel is short. I enlisted for war, end quote. Um, when Abraham Lincoln issues the Emancipation Proclamation, it's pretty clear that this is a call to William Carney to fight for his freedom. And this is going to be pretty significant especially knowing what lies ahead for him. He very likely uh, is self-liberated um, and going back to the South and going back to fight um, is an incredibly courageous act. Um, and one that we'll see that courage is, is multiplied throughout his entire life. In February of 1863, uh, he enlists for a three-year term out of New Bedford, Massachusetts. And he originally joins what is known as the Morgan Guard. Um, it's named for its, the group's white benefactor, John Morgan. Um, but about a month after Kearney joins, that group actually changes their name. And there is evidence that this change um, was, was, um, was uh, I'm losing my train of thought here, was, um, supported by the soldiers within the Morgan Guard. And so they decide to change that name um, to the Toussaint Guards, named after Toussaint Louverture, the leader of the Haitian Revolution. And this is a pretty significant change when you look at who this group is made up of. Um, this is a group made entirely of Black men, many of them formerly enslaved, although we're not entirely sure it was the majority, um, but naming your group after the leader of a successful slave result, revolt, you're looking at 
it's an empowering act for these individuals. Um, this group, the Toussaint Guards, are actually converted into what we do now know is um, the 54th Massachusetts, so the famed 54th Regiment. Um, that is led by Colonel Robert Goldshaw. And in March uh, 30th of 1863, um, Kearney is promoted to the rank of sergeant while training at Camp Meigs in Re Reedville, Massachusetts. Um, so there are some discrepancies about whether Sergeant Kearney receives this promotion in theater or while he's in, you know, following the Battle of Fort Wagner or whether that is before, but we do know that this occurs actually before um, during their training. And as I said before, the men in the 54th, um, whether they are freed or formally enslaved, are taking an enormous risk. And I think particularly this is um, best exemplified by the story of Sergeant Carney. Um, they faced the fact that if they were to be captured, they would either be sent back into slavery um, or they were not going to be captured, they would be killed on spot. Um, and I think this is one of the greatest quotes that actually shows what they faced on the home front as well. Um, and so just to read this, it was a quote from Louis Emilio, who is uh, one of the commanding officers of the 54th Massachusetts. He takes command when Robert Goldshaw is killed and later writes um, a book called uh, A Brave Black Regiment and, and details pretty, pretty well Kearney's story. Um, but the quote is, uh, the hesitant policy of our government permitted the rebels to confront every black soldier with the threat of death or slavery. If he escaped the bullet and the knife, he came back to learn that the country for which he braved that double peril intended to cheat him out of his pay on which his wife and children depended for support. And this is referencing a, a incident that occurred with the 54th Massachusetts throughout their service in which when they were recruited, they were recruited under the promise of equal pay as white soldiers. However, when they actually came to being paid, they were paid $10 a month instead of the 13 that the white soldiers received. Um, the 54th takes a incredible stand on this and, and refuses to accept the lesser pay for equal work. Um, and they actually fought 18 months, both soldiers and officers, without receiving compensation. Um, and this would have been over this period. And then finally, on June 15, 1864, Congress passes a bill that created equal pay for white and black soldiers. And in September of 1864, they retroactively um, are paid for that full 18 months of service. So this would have been something that William Carney was going through, through this period in which his Medal of Honor action occurs. Um, and it's also important to note that the risk that these men are taking are not just in confronting the Confederate army, that they are also not being treated equally on the home front as well. Um, and so I think it makes what they accomplished and what they have done and what they committed themselves to, just that more incredible. Um, the 54th Massachusetts leaves Boston for the war front in May of 1863. And by July, they are headed for Fort Wagner. Uh, Fort Wagner is a, a strategic stronghold guarding Charleston in South Carolina. Um, and there was a first attempt to assault the fort on July 11th that was unsuccessful. The fort is on a very narrow island, um, so the Union could only assault one regiment at a time. The 54th Massachusetts is chosen to lead the assault on Fort Wagner on July 18th, 1863. And this is an incredibly significant moment. It's at a time when black troops are often kept in manual labor and support roles and not on the front lines. And the 54th is given the opportunity to lead this charge. And these men see it as an opportunity to prove that they as black men can fight just as well as white soldiers as well. So under the command of Colonel Robert Gold Shaw, uh, the 54th leads the charge. Now during the charge, the color bearer um, who is holding the American flag is mortally wounded. 
and the flag begins to fall. And Sergeant Carney retrieves the American flag and continues to push forward. And in his own words, he says, quote, as we made the run for the fort embankment, I suddenly saw the old flag fall. I don't know what prompted me, but I threw my gun away, grasped the staff of the falling colors and ran for the head of the column. I often think about this and think about the idea of being in a civil war battle and dropping your only line of defense, dropping your weapon and picking up a flag, which is symbolism. Um, uh, as you know, many know, flags on civil war battlefields are also strategically important. Um, you know, they can cause extreme chaos. If you capture a flag, it can be a rallying point. They're points of morale. Um, so while it's also strategic and we have many, many Medal of Honor actions that are flag capture actions um, and many actions like William Carney's um, that I think often get a little discounted because people, you know, the, the Medal of Honor citation is just flag capture, but knowing what you have to do to get to that point that if you're capturing a flag, you're often over enemy lines or you're at the front of your lines. Um, and color bearers don't carry weapons. And in the case of William Carney, he drops his weapon in order to make sure that flag doesn't fall. But I think it's also significant when you look at the symbolism of the flag. William Carney, a man that was born enslaved in the United States, decides to drop his weapon to save this symbol. And what does that flag mean to William Carney? What does that flag mean? represent as far as freedom goes to William Carney. He is risking everything to be on that front line, and he is putting himself in the way of danger to save that symbol of the Union. And so I think it's significant in that as well. And this quote that's on the screen is my absolute favorite um, that talks about William Carney in this action. And it says, pressing his wounds with one hand and with the other holding up the emblem of freedom. He's literally using one hand to hold himself together and with the other holding the emblem of freedom and what that means to him. And I think oftentimes the accounts of, of Carney's action curse over a little too much about um, his injuries. Uh, he is injured multiple times in trying to plant that flag upon the parapet. Um, he's shot in the chest. He's shot in the arm. His leg is shattered. Uh, there are reports that at times he continued moving forward with the flag only by crawling amongst the dead and the dying. Um, and so he is putting his life on the line. He is giving everything he can to making sure that this symbol is okay. And it's just an incredible when you think about how what that means to him as a formerly enslaved man. Um, I always take a moment to pause and to think about that idea of the flag and how that persists. William Carney gets the flag and as they begin to retreat, he also brings it back to the line and there's reports that he will not hand this flag over to anyone but a member of the 54th Massachusetts, that he is guarding this flag with his life. And so when he finally gets back to the line, the famous, the famous exclamation of him is, boys, the old flag never touched the ground. And so this is the incredible line, and, and we'll talk about it a little bit further later, um, that's going to persist long, long after Carney. Um, and he's met with by his men and his men, you know, he collapses into them and he hands the flag over to another member of the 54th, which is just so important to him. The Union loses the battle um, and about 600 of the 600 men of the 54th, 42 percent uh, 272 individuals are wounded, captured, or killed. Um, the 54th Massachusetts takes a big hit. Two months later, in September of 1863, uh, Confederate forces finally abandon Fort Wagner and the Union takes over. After the war, uh, in June of 1864, Kearney receives an honorable discharge from the U.S. Army 
because of the injuries that he has sustained at the Battle of Fort Wagner. And I think what's most significant about Sergeant Kearney is that he becomes a pretty incredible icon of the 54th Massachusetts. And people often compare him as an icon, almost as big as Robert Goldshaw, their commanding officer who was killed in battle. And William Kearney, he goes on, there are songs written about this action. There are poems written about this action. He it becomes a central symbol of the strength of the 54th Massachusetts and the fighting ability and the fighting power of the 54th. And what's really significant is that he also becomes a symbol in his statement of the flag not touching the ground as a way to recruit Black men to join the Union Army. That William Carney's stamina, his courage, his dedication becomes a way to get others to join the effort. Um, and I think probably one of the best ways that this is kind of encompassed, there's historian David Blight um, in his book, Race and Reconciliation, um, says that along with, with the soldier Robert Smalls, Kearney was, quote, the closest thing to a national Black war hero from the Civil War, end quote. And this is before he receives the Medal of Honor. So this is before he, he is even a recipient of the Medal of Honor. Um, and we'll talk a little bit how standards of the medal have changed, but it still carries the same uh, similar weight back in the day. Um, Carney is so significant that a monument of him that is erected in Norfolk, Virginia, his birthplace, is one of only three created by 1990 in the former Confederacy that honors an African-American soldier. After the war, while all of this is going on, in October of 1865, he returns, well, he returns after the war to New Bedford, Massachusetts, and marries uh, Susanna Williams. She's also originally from Norfolk, Norfolk Virginia. Um, it's unclear whether they knew each other prior. Um, by 1866, he was working as the superintendent of street lamps in New Bedford. Um, and I think this is really where we start to see a lot of that personality from before the war come out as well. He becomes a really active member in the Baptist community in New Bedford. He serves as the choir master. Um, he helped found the Union Baptist Church. He, we know that he goes on and he collects China. He is a singer. Um, he sings the national anthem at many, many events. Um, and he becomes this active, vibrant community member in New Bedford, Massachusetts. Um, he also uses his recognition as a war hero um, to advance the causes that he believes in. Um, in 1865, he held a banner at a 4th of July celebration in New Bedford, Massachusetts. And the banner read, the hand that holds the musket should have the ballot. Um, so he becomes active in, in those causes and he tries to use his stature uh, to advance what, what he believes in. Um, and in 1869, he becomes a letter carrier for the United States Postal Service, a position that he holds for 32 years. Um, he became a founding member of the New Bedford Branch 18 National Association of Letter Carriers. So in many aspects of his life, you see that he becomes a leader not just joining organizations, but leading them. Um, he becomes an officer in the new post of the GAR, uh, named for his old officer, Robert Gould Shaw. And in 1980, excuse me, 1897, when the 54th Massachusetts Regiment Memorial is unveiled in Boston Common, Kearney ma marched in the procession with his fellow veterans. And Booker T. Washington is the speaker that day and in his own memoirs, uh, he remembers an interaction with Kearney during the dedication ceremony. And Booker T. Washington says, quote, the flag Sergeant Kearney held in his hands as he sat on the platform. And when I turned to address the survivors of the colored regiment who were present and referred to Sergeant Kearney, he rose as if by instinct and raised the flag. It has been my privilege to witness a good many satisfactory and rather sensational demonstrations in connection with some of my public addresses. 
but in dramatic effect, I have never seen or experienced anything which equaled this. For a number of minutes, the audience seemed to entirely lose control of itself. And so Carney goes on and he is this active veteran. He lives this incredible, vibrant life. Um, and this is all before he receives the Medal of Honor. And so as we know, the Medal of Honor during the Civil War, it's the majority of Civil War Medal of Honors are actually awarded after the conflict. And so Carney is not recognized for his actions at the Battle of Fort Wagner until May 23rd, 1900. Part of our research at the museum is we'd like to know a little bit more about when he received that medal. We have a date, but that's about it at this point. Um, it's not uncommon for Civil War Medal of Honors to only have a date of award and to not have too much information. Sometimes they were mailed to the individuals. Um, and so we don't have too much information on when he actually received that medal. Um, after leaving the Postal Service, Carney becomes a messenger at the Massachusetts State House. Um, and unfortunately, in December of 1908, while he was working at the State House, he sustained fatal injuries from an elevator accident. There are several accounts that say he was stepping backwards out of the elevator in order to make room um, for another individual. Um, and he unfortunately dies of those injuries in 1908. I think it's pretty significant um, that following that his death, um, the flags at the Massachusetts State House are lowered to half staff in order in honor of Sergeant Carney. And this is the first time, the first recorded time that that honor was given to a black man. So to understand what Carney meant to the community, um, what his bravery, what his courage, um, I often think back to the idea that this man's life could have been very different. He's born enslaved and he ends up um, in a in a truly a place of honor uh, in not only the state of Massachusetts, but I think um, the hearts of, of, of America. And so to give you a little bit of background on how these stories will be told um, at our museum, this is just a, a rendering of the museum that is being built in Arlington, Texas. Um, as you may have noticed today, I try not to focus too much on the action because we are trying to give the idea that these individuals, Medal of Honor recipients, are more than the single action that often defines them. William Carney lives a vibrant, incredible life and displays courage, he displays dedication, he displays valor beyond just that one moment, that his life embodies all of these ideals and all of these characteristics. And so what we're trying to do is take stories like William Carney and show that they are not restricted to just one conflict. William Carney's courage that occurs in the Civil War is just as courageous as actions that occur throughout Vietnam, as actions that occur during the global war on terror. And so what can we learn from William Carney's stories, from those characteristics that he embodies? We're using those as points of inspiration. Um, particularly with the story of William Carney, I like to highlight the idea of what does citizenship mean to William Carney? What does the symbol of freedom of the flag, what does that mean to William Carney? Um, and what does that, how does that translate into our lives today? Um, so as we go through and we are looking at the stories of the Medal of Honor, obviously it, we can't fit 3,500 into one space at once. Um, but what I think we can do is use these stories that are representative of many. There are multiple recipients that are born enslaved and go on to receive the Medal of Honor. There are multiple recipients that aren't born as citizens of the country that go on to receive the Medal of Honor. And so what does that say about their idea of patriotism? Because I think William Carney embodies an incredible ideal of, of what it means to be patriotic and what does citizenship mean. Um, and so what we're trying to do is use these stories as points of connection, as points of inspiration. Um, our big idea is that we do not expect those who come to visit the museum to join the military and perform a Medal of Honor action but there are ways that those characteristics can translate into your life every single day. 
um, characteristics of sacrifice, of integrity, um, and of courage. And so William Carney's story is going to be just one of many that we are highlighting within the museum space. Um, and it's going to be one that I, I think is important to be told and I think is, is an inspirational uh, story for, for everyone. Um, so thank you for, for listening to the, the story of William Carney and I would love if anyone has any questions uh, to take those. Thank you, Jenny. That was that was excellent. Uh, I've got one question just out of curiosity. So how are you making the, the decision on whose stories to include? Yeah, so it's been a it's been a tough decision. We are balancing a lot of different types of diversity. So first we're looking at diversity of branches of the gov of the military. We're looking diversity of conflicts. We're looking at religious diversity, and we're looking at um, ethnic and racial diversity. We want to make sure that we are building a museum that is inclusive and diverse in all ways. Um, so that's one of our one of our steps. The next is looking at stories that we can tell um, beginning to end. Um, so as far as what research is available. Um, we are also driven by what artifacts are available. And then we're looking at stories that are impactful for the most, for the broad audience, um, that are easy for individuals to digest in some ways, but we don't want to shy away from those more complicated stories. So making sure we have a balance. Um, it's been, I'll, I'll be honest, extremely hard because we add more than we subtract. It's very hard to take individuals off the featured recipient list. It's very easy to make a case to put them on. Um, and we are doing all of this with the idea of rotation in mind. And I think we more than most museums will be rotating very frequently. Um, and so there are individuals that we already know, hey, we might not be able to fit them in for opening, but we know that they will be in this museum in five years or in 10 years. So we know that in a museum like this, there has to be rotation because there's too many rich stories to tell. Um, eventually, we want to tell them all in the museum. Um, we are also coming up with ways to tell them beyond the museum space. One of those is we will be launching um, very soon a Medal of Honor database that is going to be an online space that will be hubs of information for the recipients. So as much information as I can gain on one recipient, I am going to have here so that anyone who goes to look up that recipient has as much information as we have. Um, and that's really important because many of these recipients, uh, specifically Civil War recipients, we don't even have an image for them. And so how can we tell their stories as best as possible with as much information as we have? So to answer your question, it's been, it's been difficult <laughs> and it'll continue to be difficult, but that's a sign that you have really great um, inspirational and robust stories to tell. Definitely. Well, getting back to Carney, Nils has a uh, question mm -hmm. uh, about whether Carney left any uh, reflections on uh, Colonel Shaw and his personality. I'm not sure about specifically on his personality. Um, Carney doesn't write a whole lot. Um, and I think part of it is if you look at the end of his life, he is he is pretty well tied up in in the different um, events that he does in the different community um, community groups that he's involved in. Um, he writes a one piece within the Liberator um, that is about his experience. And that's where we get a little bit of the information on um, his father. That's where we get a little bit of the information on his action. Um, and I believe Colonel Shaw is mentioned in there once um, on his death, but we don't get much about his personality in there. Um, but it's also because we don't have a, a, an abundance of, of pieces written by Carney himself. And then another question, since Southern state, state laws prohibited teaching slaves to read and write, 
how did Carney acquire his literacy? That's a great question. Um, most likely. So again, we know most about his literacy from this one piece that he's written. Um, it's unclear whether he learned to read and write definitively while he was a slave or just after um, he, he found liberation. Most likely, though, it was well enslaved, and very likely it was through a minister that was teaching him how to read and write. I believe the estimated year is about when he was 11 years old, um, but it's most likely through a minister, and that's most likely why he was studying the Bible so closely, um, is because his education comes through a minister that is teaching him how to read and write. Thank you. So the 54th had been involved in the fighting on James Island on July 16th, two days before the attack on Fort Wagner. While this mm -hmm. engagement was primarily a skirmish, they distinguished themselves in covering the retreat for a white Union brigade. Since the Confederates, inten since the Confederates intended the burial of, oh, I, well, maybe that was just a comment, uh, but he goes on and says, since the Confederates intended the burial of Colonel Shaw, with his black troops as a disgrace, what observations did Carney make about the burial? And I'm gonna assume that he didn't make observations about that. He did not, no. And I'm sure, I'm, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the quote from um, Colonel Robert Goldshaw's uh, parents, but it, that is one of my favorite quotes from the 54th. I didn't include it in here, um, but when they, they talk about the idea that uh, Colonel Shaw is buried in dishonor. His father actually comments on it and says, we can imagine no holier place than that in which he lies among his brave and devoted followers, nor wish him for him better company. Um, so while Carney doesn't comment on it, um, Shaw's family is obviously, does not see that as a dishonor. And I think it also is, is a testament to how, how Shaw is seen by those men as well. Um, and Shaw, it, as I'm sure you're familiar with, has um, there's extensive writing on how he drills these men and how he makes them into these incredible soldiers um, and that connection between the two, um, between commander and, and soldier. And Emily would like to know whether Carney has any living relatives to send them. He does. Um, he, he has a, I'm not entirely sure how many greats, but a great, great nephew um, that is still living in New Bedford, Massachusetts. Um, he had one daughter named Clara. Um, we have, I have been in contact with his nephew um, and his great, great nephew um, is very involved in the New Bedford Historical Society and does quite a bit um, to preserve the, the, legacy in the story of Sergeant Carney. Um, so he is an excellent, excellent resource. He has written a lot. I would really encourage you to look up his writing on Sergeant Carney as it's one of one of the best sources. I think um, his name is Carl Cruz. Um, and again, he has written quite a bit. You can definitely find it online. That's excellent. And kind of going back to the your museum, mm -hmm. are you doing a documentary film of the start and progress of the museum? And then also, are you going to have a traveling exhibit to share with the country? So we are not doing a documentary film. I think many of us are keeping uh, photographs just for ourselves because it is such a, a unique um, experience, uh, not just from uh, the, the museum field standpoint, but the any any standpoint, the idea that we can work so closely with many of these Medal of Honor recipient families. Um, so there isn't an official documentary. I would love one. I'm sure you know someone around here is probably talking about the possibility of one. Um, and I'm sorry, what was the second part of that question, Kelly? Uh, the traveling exhibits. Traveling and exhibits. You start to rotate uh, things out at the museum while you have a traveling exhibit. Yeah, we don't have any plans specifically for a traveling exhibit, but our curator does have plans as far as um, having a pretty robust outgoing loan program. Um, we are not, we have taken a pretty pretty hard stance that we do not want collections sitting in cabinets. We do not want them sitting in archives. What we have, we want out. 
the part of the museum, you know, the biggest mission for us is these stories need to be told. Um, and one of the easiest connection points with people is through these artifacts. Um, so what we have, what we are able to loan out um, in the future, we would like to have a really robust outgoing loan program. So what is not on display at our museum is being told elsewhere and that people who can't get to, I, I know Arlington, Texas is far for a lot of people, uh, people that can't get there, um, we are doing as much as we can in order to tell these stories um, in other places. Uh, because ultimately the most important thing about all of this is that these stories are told. That's at the end of the day, these stories need to be told and however we are able to do that, um, we are going to. And uh, is there a reason uh, in particular why the museum is based in Arlington, Texas? Um, so they did a national search for it. Uh, ultimately, it came down to we got a lot, a lot of um, support. There is a big veteran community in Dallas and Fort Worth that we got incredible support from. Um, we also got a lot of support from the city of Arlington. Um, it's a very accessible place. DFW is the hub of American Airlines, so there are lots of flights in and out. We are located in the Entertainment District of Arlington, Texas. Um, right now, I'm sitting in the old Texas Rangers baseball stadium that has been converted to offices. Uh, next door, we've got literally, if you look out the window right behind me, it's Globe Life Field where the Texas Rangers uh, play now. And about a half a mile down the street, we've got AT&T Stadium. So there are lots and lots of visitors to this area of Texas every year. And so part of what we're doing is getting those stories out. And so this becomes a place um, where you've got a lot of people coming in and out. Pre-COVID, this area of Texas got about 14 million visitors a year. Wow. Um, so it's an excellent place um, as far as getting people to come here. It's also in close to the middle of the country. So getting back and forth, I'll tell you, it's three hours west, it's three hours east um, <laughs> on a plane. So it, it becomes a really accessible place and just the, the veteran community and the, the support for the U.S. military down here is really incredible. That's great. So getting back to Carney, uh, mm -hmm. Niels wants to know what contributions did Carney make toward the cause of civil rights for freed people during Reconstruction? We, I don't have too much information on that. Um, part of what I have seen is his banner that he holds at the 4th of July um, parade. Um, that is so far what I have found as far as using his, um, using his status as a war hero. Um, so to say I use the term hero pretty loosely um, because I know people have, have some commentary on that. Um, however, you know, we do know that he is he is pretty involved as far as um, the the Grand Army of the Republic in the post um, getting that set up. He is one of the only black veterans within there. Um, but as far as specific civil rights for reconstruction, I don't have too much on that. Um, and I'm not sure he has again, his writing is is pretty limited um, on on most subjects, including his own life. Um, so I'm not entirely sure if he, what he does 